Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we're getting ready for question and answer. I want to ask one question to Dr. Hal over here. Dr. Hal, I promised everybody you were going to tell them what you thought the maximum temperature rise was going to be by the end of this century. So I'm going to ask you the first question. Do you want to tell them that? <laughs> yeah. When we determined our transient climate sensitivity value and we put an upper bound on it of uh, 1.8 degrees centigrade, we looked at our projected CO2 rise for the rest of this century and that transient climate sensitivity and we predict less than one degree C rise by 2100. That's all we can see from the data. And our projection of how CO2 is gonna rise in the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels. Yeah. Good, thank you. Okay, questions, here's one right here. I, uh, thank you, and thank you all gentlemen. Um, just an observation, one of the things that um, I read from one of my early climate change Bibles uh, from um, Ian Plymer was that CO2, in his opinion, was a trailer of, uh, of climate change and, and the cycle, not a driver of it. But uh, that isn't my question. Um, my question is that I recently I sat through, in fact, a week ago, I sat through a webinar on plant phenology and how plants and animals were going to have to adapt to this climate change. And the lady that put it on um, was a, uh, from a, um, a nonprofit uh, supported by government called the National Phenology Network. And um, she didn't make any statements about climate change other than an underlying assumption that it was gonna happen, even though she hadn't noticed very much where she's working what, in New what, Mexico. What, but what my question, question is, <laughs> When does weather become climate? Because she talked greatly about annual and periodic climate weather variation. But when does weather become climate? A long, a long way down the, the, the weather becomes climate a long way down the road <laughs> after you've uh, gone a century or so, really. Um, let me ask everybody, just please just ask a question and not get into a statement and trying to re-educate everybody. That's what the panel is supposed to be for here today. Do any of you guys want to, why don't you uh, take on the question there, Tom? You're our meteorologist. Well, <clears throat> climate is a sum total of years and years of weather when you average it out, and like Leighton said, over centuries. Uh, climate can change rapidly, but it's still the sum total of many, many weather events. And that means definitely extends well over a year, well over a decade. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of hundreds of years to change climate as opposed to weather. And I might add, relative to what happens to the plants and animals and so forth, we've got this great uh, amount of uh, information that comes from Craig Edso that is here at this climate conference, go to co2science.com and he has this documented as to what's happened as the temperature has gone up and down and sideways and so forth really well. So I would recommend his site to get a lot of good information on that. Here's yeah, a question. Question for Hal or anybody else. Does require some background. Hal, you mentioned uh, you were projecting that atmospheric CO2 might get up to 600 parts per million. I think you know about uh, Henry's law, the relationship between the z dissolved gas, in this case CO2 in the oceans and CO2 in the atmosphere, and that there's an equilibrium, probably long term, between those quantities. Since the oceans contain 50 times as much carbon dioxide dissolved as the atmosphere, how is it possible for us to get to 600 parts per million unless the oceans are driving that rise? Yeah, I'm sorry, I did not hear very clearly, but um, since we began rising CO2 in the atmosphere, about half of the CO2 that we've emitted into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels has remained in the atmosphere. The other part's been gobbled up by the Earth's ecosystem. And we check that, that's been happening 
uh, at a very constant rate. Even though we increase the emissions rate, the oceans get half of it every year. Or, or, and I think some of the land eco system does too. I don't see that changing. Now the equilibrium climate sensitive uh, sensitivity models assume that a lot of that carbon comes out of the ocean. But it's not happening. It hasn't happened since the pre-industrial era. And so the data says the oceans are going to keep gobbling it up. And if you try to hold it constant the way you do in an equilibrium climate sensitive solution, you are not being realistic. Because the oceans will try to take that CO2 out, which means in effectiveness, to hold it constant, they're adding a lot of CO2 from external to the system, and they don't keep track of it. And I suspect they've used more fossil fuels than we've got on the planet to get an ECS calculation. It needs to be investigated. Question. Hey, I've got the. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, this is uh, one of Tom's uh, slides. Uh, I found very interesting. Um, one thing that's confounded with the um, north-south uh, hemispheric differences is uh, that um, there's a 3% difference in planetary distance from perihelion to aphelion. And I show uh, tomorrow that temperature is, is proportional to the square root of our distance from the sun. So that's about a 1% or somewhat over a 1% difference in temperature between perihelion and aphelion. And his slide was very interesting that it shows that January, when, when we're near perihelion, is apparently warmer than when we're at do you, do you have a question? Well, Tom, you can say that. <laughs> well, you got it right. I mean, that's all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Questions? Short to the point. Thanks, guys. Here we go. I was wondering if anybody can explain or... Uh, the Agenda 21 with the Rio Conference in 1991, when they got together and produced the Agenda 21, and George H. Bush signed it, and it's a one world government and it influenced environmental policies, Common Core, and everything else that we're experiencing today. Do you know about Agenda 21 and uh, how it is now influencing the environmental, uh, what we are, uh, what we have today? And, uh, but through Agenda 21 in 1991, I don't know if you know anything about it, whether that it's influencing because it's what the world a world or order as far as what the politicians at the time wanted, and now it's been put in, uh, put in place. I, it, Agenda 21, do you know what about What was the question? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm hard of hearing if also. Can, if you can explain Agenda 21 in relationship to the environment. Tom, do you know did anything you hear about the Agenda question? 21? No, I couldn't hear, I'm sorry. Uh, can, can, did you hear it well enough to repeat the question? Did I? Uh, yeah, so she essentially asked, how does Agenda 21 play into the current environmental movement? Okay, I don't think I know. <laughs> I, I don't know enough to confidently right. answer, and if I don't know the answer, I won't give you one. All right, so we have time for one last question. Who wants it most? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah, thank you for your remarks. So I see three gentlemen up at the table who have had long and prestigious careers, and in retirement, I feel like you could have done anything that you wanted yet here you are um, fighting this, this other battle that you've chosen. So I'm wondering if you can put words to that for me. Why, why is this issue important to you? What gets you out of bed in the morning to keep on going? Uh, oh, looks like Walt wants this one. Well, I can only tell you that I don't take this on as a campaign, uh, as an issue if it comes up and I see things that are being basically laid out on our public that have no merit that I can possibly see. Now you can say, well, he's got to be wrong. Actually, my career, I've survived by being reasonably intelligent. Unfortunately, I have an addiction to always go look at why something happens and what you can do about it. And today, I have to tell you, I have not found one, one iota of evidence that we ought to be concerned about what's happening to the temperature and then trying to claim that the carbon dioxide level is what's causing it. If you look in history, you'll find that the temperature always goes up before the carbon dioxide level does. Uh, thank goodness for these people that speak up, because uh, 
One of the reasons the letter was written to NASA was because we were getting worried not just about current NASA's reputation, but after about another couple of decades here and everybody realizes that this has just been a big scam, it's going to damage the reputation of anybody that ever worked for NASA because they're going to say, oh, look, those guys used to believe that uh, we were get really having uh, big problems here with this. So these guys are also trying to guard the reputation of science itself. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. And questions are, are fair game in the hall.